This episode is part of Lanfrica Talks. Lanfrica Talks provides a platform to showcase efforts in language technologies around the world. To learn more or attend our live sessions, see the description below. Good day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Lanfrica Talks. I'm your moderator, Chris, and for those who are new to the show, the Lanfrica Talks is a place to discover inspiring stories, pioneering projects, research businesses, and more. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel for more talk shows. Today, we host Prof. Yoshua Benjo. Prof. Yoshua Benjo is recognized worldwide as one of the leading experts in artificial intelligence known for his conceptual and engineering breakthroughs in artificial neural networks and deep learning. He is a full professor in the Department of Computer Science and Operations Research at the University of Montreal, and the founder and scientific director of Miller Quebec AI Institute, one of the world's largest academic institutes in deep learning. He is also the scientific director of IVADO. His scientific contributions have earned him numerous awards he is the 2018 laureate of the A.M. Turing Award, the Nobel Prize of Computing, alongside Geoffrey Hinton and Yann Lacan for their important contributions and advances in deep learning. In 2002, he was appointed Knight of the Legion of Honor by France and named co-laureate of Spain's Princess of Asturias Award for Technical and Scientific Research. Later that year, Professor Benjo became the most cited computer science in the world in terms of H-Index. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of London and of Canada, an officer of the Order of Canada and a Canadian Cypher AI Chair. And I must add, um, recently Congress on the Time 100 in AI. We're very happy to have you, Prof. Yosha Benjo, and the floor is yours. Thank you. So today, my talk will not be very technical. It's going to be more political, if you want. And it's about scenarios that I think we should think about and prepare against in the coming years or decades as AI systems improve in terms of capability, but the risks they pose to democracy, societies, and humanity increase. Well, let's start with a very basic question because we were talking about AI. What is intelligence? Um, the definition I'd like to give um, is centered around three abilities. The ability to understand, which you know, corresponds to having a good internal model of how things work. Second, the ability to achieve goals. This is what you find in reinforcement learning, but you can generalize this to the ability to answer questions. So if you consider a future version of uh, chat GPT, it can answer lots of questions. So that's a very strong ability. Of course, that ability hinges on the first one, the ability to understand and make sense of the world. And the third one is the ability to learn quickly, to obtain uh, that understanding and, and that ability to achieve goals. Because we don't know what you know the right understanding or the right uh, way to achieve goals are in general. And so the main way that an intelligence system can obtain those abilities is through experience and data. Okay, so that's for a definition. And it's important the way I, I, I said it because we're gonna see later that you could have you know, very strong intelligence in terms of achieving goals um, in some domains, but not in others or understanding in some domains, but not in others uh, because we're gonna be talking about superhuman AI. And so what does it mean if uh, an AI is much stronger than us in some areas, but maybe not so good in other areas. But fundamentally, there's a important scientific and even philosophical questions. Um, many people don't 
accept the idea that we could we could build machines that are more intelligent than us. Um, but there's a simple answer to this, which is that you know there's a consensus in biology in neuroscience that our brains are biological machines. Of course, they are different from the computers we're building, but they are machines, and those machines although they evolved rather than having been designed, they still operate uh, according to some principles. And we've made a lot of progress in understanding some of those principles. There's no reason to think that we couldn't build AI systems that rely on the same kinds of principles in the future. And thus that could be at least as intelligent as us. In fact, there is no known upper limit, although Computer science suggests that there would be upper limits to intelligence, but still it could be much above ours. Regarding goals and the ability to achieve them, there's a very important notion that comes from research in AI safety, which is kind of bad news for humanity and the stability of our societies. That is the notion that goals can be set independently from intelligence. So they're kind of orthogonal to intelligence. You could have a, a system that's very smart um, in its ability to achieve goals, but you could set those goals independently of the way that the intelligence, uh, uh, you know, its, its abilities. Of course, some goals may be easier to achieve or some goals may be better suited to uh, uh, a you know, in a domain where you don't have a lot of intelligence. So there are dependencies there. But the important thing is, once you have figured out how to build uh, systems that can achieve goals, let's say in some domain, um, then you can pretty much set the goals as you want. In other words, the AI is dual use. It's not exactly true, this independence for humans, because we have goals that we cannot easily get rid of, at least not most of us, for example, cannot uh, abstract away our emotional instincts, our empathy uh, for the suffering of others. But but an AI and you know some humans, sociopaths in particular, can essentially consider any goal, assuming the 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 goal reaching, the goal optimizing machinery uh, knows about, um, uh, has enough knowledge to, to achieve those goals. So what, what it means in practice is that an AI can be dangerous if it is in the wrong hands, in the hands of uh, people or organizations that will set those goals. So that's, that's one way in which it can be dangerous. The other way it can be dangerous if, is if those goals were set not by humans, but by the AI itself, if it has a sort of autonomy and um, if it has a goal of self-preservation, which of course all living beings that have evolved uh, have a self-preservation instinct, a self-preservation goal. The problem with that is that in AI, whether you know its goals were set by humans or you know there are goals that it set itself, may have goals that are not compatible with our well-being, the well-being of our societies and of humanity. And, and that's why you know I'm talking to you today. The other very basic notion that we need to digest, to the obvious, but intelligence gives power. So intelligence is just not a, an abstract thing that allows you to achieve goals and understand better. It's something that can be turned into actions in order to increase one's control of one's environment. Uh, so for example, our intelligence gives us power over other species. And in fact, not necessarily because we wanted, but we didn't care too much about the survival of about a thousand species that have already disappeared in the last few hundred years. And that power, in case of humans, is derived from both advances in science, which increase our understanding, and technology, which increase our ability to solve problems and achieve goals. 
what we have observed in the last few decades, but especially in the last few years, is that the research and development in AI is making the intelligence of AI systems increase. And we are on this curve, a trajectory of increasing intelligence in AI systems, which means that these systems or the people who control them will have increasing power in our society. And the, the rate at which this intelligence and this power are increasing uh, is probably itself going to increase because the investment in AI R&D is exploding right now thanks to the impressive abilities that have been demonstrated with uh, generative AI, especially chat GPT. So yeah, we don't know exactly what the trajectory is, but it could go pretty quickly. So how can power be used? Well, you can think of it like there's a, there's the good side and there's the evil side. Power to help others, to heal others, to improve their well-being. Practically, we'd like to build AI systems that help us address the sustainable development goals of the UN, for example, who will help us improve democracy, for example, by um, fact-checking. But um, that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, of course, is that power, especially thinking about the power, power that AI could give, um, could be used to uh, enhance one's power, the, the entity that controls that power, whether it's a human or a machine or a country. So often the power to oneself uh, primarily is targeted at self-preservation. But in order to improve our chances of surviving, um, we typically need to be able to control our environment as much as possible. And in order to make sure others don't uh, harm us, um, a natural slope uh, is to try to dominate others. Now, that domination may just be economic. If you think about corporations, they're trying to maximize profit. They're trying to uh, increase their market share. So they're trying to dominate their competitors. That's one kind of dominance, but you could also have political dominance. And we're already seeing governments trying to use AI in order to squash their opponents, to uh, track what their population is doing. And that's, of course, something very dangerous that threatens democracy. Uh, finally, the power that AI could give could be used to achieve uh, military dominance. And there's uh, clearly a lot of effort that's motivated by uh, the military arms of governments. And there's a war right now where clearly AI is being developed and used um, to increase uh, military success. And, and, and all of that could threaten the peace and stability of the world. To better understand the safety issue with AI, you need to understand the notion of alignment. The idea of alignment uh, of AI is that we want to make sure that the AI behaves according to our intentions. Although it sounds simple, like you know, you could have Asimov's laws of robotics. Actually, there's a lot of research showing that it's hard. In fact, it's so hard that we don't know how to build an AI right now. We don't know how to build an AI that will behave according to our intentions. Because fundamentally, it's hard to spell out our intentions in sufficiently complete way. This has been studied in economics quite a lot. In fact, there was a recent Nobel Prize about this. In theory of contracts, if you have a contract between a principal, you know, a, a company that want company A that wants some job done, and they they're going to pay company B um, to execute the contract, uh, company A would like to clarify their intention, what they want from B, 
as much as possible, but it's impossible. In general, there is an exponential number of cases that uh, cannot be spelled out in the contract. And so this is called the theory of incomplete contracts, but it's a problem with AI. Company B could be sort of cheating, and I'll talk more about that, um, like finding the loopholes in the contract, just like currently companies find loopholes in the law and they use lobbying to change the contract to their advantage, changing the laws. So if we try to coax an AI to behave according to our attention and, and we don't fully succeed, well, what's the problem? Well, um, there's also a lot of research in AI safety suggesting that this could give rise to AI systems that have a self-preservation objective. And of course, their preservation may not be aligned with our preservation. Uh, in fact, uh, this may emerge as a side effect of other goals and, and having misalignment. So if you ask an AI to perform a particular task for your own benefit, but then the AI kind of implicitly realizes that in order to achieve the task, it needs to preserve itself then you see that self-preservation, although it could be something that a human explicitly gives to the AI, could also be something that emerges as a side effect of other goals and misalignment. And if there are AIs with self-preservation goals, then they could potentially be dangerous to humanity and could try to dominate us, at least not behave according to what we want. So this, this issue of... Uh, the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, of course, is something that's happening already, not with AI, but uh, with companies. And uh, they they try to be legal, but maximize profit. And, and to do that, they, you know, they hire armies of lawyers to find loopholes in the laws. And they succeed. Uh, in fact, they succeed so much that they can even change their own reward function by changing the laws using lobbying. So that you know the new laws, modified laws will favor them. And I think this is a good analogy to what may go wrong as we build more and more powerful AI systems. So long, so long as the AI systems are not too powerful, then maybe this is not something we need to worry about. And companies, although they are threatening us uh, by trying to deceive us and manipulate us. So think about fossil fuel companies that have been hiding the information about the danger of climate change due to fossil fuels for many decades. The more powerful the company or the more powerful the AI, the more dangerous that deception could be. Okay, so let's go back to misalignment and the sorts of misalignment that could exist. And here I list three kinds of misalignments. The first one is misalignment between human, a human, and society. So it's not even about AI, but AI being used by a human in an intentionally harmful way because of, you know, seeking more power, uh, more, more, you know, more money, um, economic dominance, um, having some sort of uh, uh, political goals, um, uh, you know, hateful goals, military objectives, and so on. So humans will be misusing AI to achieve their malicious goals. That's the first kind. It's a misalignment between the human that directs those AIs and society. Second kind is a misalignment between the human operator and the AI. Here, the human doesn't want to harm. So they're going to be using AI as an unintentionally harmful tool. Think about bias and discrimination or political polarization of social media. The companies that have been rolling out products using AI that are actually harmful to society probably did not intend that harm, but it's happening. The third kind of a misalignment is misalignment between the AI and society itself. So this is the case of you know, losing control to an AI that has its own goals which again can happen intentionally or not. Somebody could decide that, oh, they want their AI to be just like humans, to, to have their own goals. Or it, you know, it could be a side effect of some other things. 
at the end of the day, we end up with rogue autonomous AI systems. Um, um, there are that, of course, could be very dangerous and I think create an existential risk. Um, it could happen quickly or it could happen slowly through the phenomenon of disempowerment, where, you know, imagine most of the work and most of the um, productivity um, in coming decades comes from AI and, and gradually humans become useless. So that's, that's a, a different kind of loss of control that people have been thinking about. Okay, so a lot of these dangers hinge on uh, future scenarios where AI systems will become gradually more and more powerful, eventually surpassing our own intelligence, at least in some domains. It, and, and in fact, AI systems don't need to be superhuman in every domain to be dangerous. It, it's enough that they be superhuman in domains that provide them with power to dominate humans. For example, financial trading that, you know, if they get really good at it, they could dominate economically. Um, psychological manipulation, for example, to influence people to vote one way versus another way. Um, cyber attacks that that could, you know, give them power over our whole um, infrastructure. Um, weapon design, which, which could be used uh, to dominate uh, humans at the military level. So, so when could that happen? It's not now yet. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about when that could happen, but but the, there's a sort of agreement among many researchers that um, it could be just a few years or it could be a few decades. So Jeff Hinton, Jan LeCan and I, who won the Turing Award together, agree actually, even though we disagree on what to do about it, but we agree that it could come pretty quickly. Um, now, one interesting notion here is that if we ended up building machines that have the same uh, abilities as human in terms of uh, intellectual capacities, they would automatically be superhuman because of advantages arising from digital computers, like faster learning, faster action you know, cycles, um, better memory. Um, and, and that could give them a big advantage. So already we can see like chat GPT has been trained in just a few months, and it has read uh, more text than any human could read over many tens of thousands of lifetimes. So this is this is pretty uh, scary stuff um, if AI become uh, superhuman. And it could happen pretty soon, but at the same time, we can't be sure. It could be much more. Um, Going back to the loss of control scenarios, just to detail like two main ways in which it can happen. Uh, so the first one is what I call a Frankenstein scenario in which a human gives a self-preservation goal to the AI. Um, could be a human who doesn't understand the consequences. Uh, maybe they just want their AI to be just like them, uh, that like, like in the Frankenstein uh, plot. The other is more subtle. Uh, it could be that People who design frontier AI systems don't realize that some of the goals they might give could give rise to the emergence of self-preservation goals. Um, there are other related problems that people have been studying in AI safety research. The problem of reward hacking, which is like lobbying for companies, where they would uh, be able to give themselves the rewards that normally we give them in a way that actually doesn't doesn't satisfy what we really want. So you know, you could imagine that they go and press on the button that says "Good AI, Good AI," even though we are not satisfied, and and that of course opens the door to major misalignment once they control their own rewards. Just like companies controlling the laws, right? It's the same principle. Now, there's an aspect of all this which I have hinted a bit about, but but I want to go uh, deeper into, which is the problem of power concentration. First of all, power concentration is at exact odds, the opposite of democracy, because democracy literally means power to the people. It means sharing power. And as we uh, move forward, it looks like we're, you know, in a direction of increasing power concentration right now in the hands of a few companies, 
potentially one day, you know, in in the hands of a few human beings who are operating uh, the best AIs that exist in the world. So what's the problem with that? Well, um, imagine some people have uh, access to the first superhuman AI that can be much more powerful than existing ones. And they would be like the king of the planet. That would be extreme power concentration. And of course, it would threaten democracy. It's not just economic dominance that these uh, guys would get. They could take over governments because they would have the means to impose their will using AI. And it is important to understand that this problem of power concentration uh, is different from the problem of uh, you know, AI safety and loss of control that I just discussed. Because even if we solve the safety problem, like if we are able to design AI systems that are aligned with the intentions of the operator, in the wrong hands, this uh, AI system that is safe could still be not safe for humanity because it could be in the hands of uh, a human who wants to you know, become the dictator of the planet. So uh, yeah, this power concentration issue is quite important. And the two issues are not unrelated to each other because uh, let's say we didn't fully solve the problem of AI safety and we have gradually more powerful AI systems and that, that power is concentrated in the hands of a few people. Well, these humans would be presumably trying to use AI to increase their power uh, so they would try to maintain their dominance, um, increase it to protect themselves from other humans who might challenge it. And they would focus on, on, on this power-seeking objective rather than on the objective of protecting humanity from a rogue AI, a rogue autonomous AI. See, there is a lot of historical evidence that um, dictators or you know, uh, concentrated authoritarian governments are not as wise as democratic governments. The reason is that non-democratic decision-taking is not as robust. It lacks the checks and balances of democracies. Whereas in democracies, you've got decisions that are taken that are somewhat more uh, the result of a consensus, of a, of a discussion, of a compromise. These, this, these decisions um, come out of aggregating the uh, opinions and desires of many uh, people and groups of people and many interpretations of reality. And for machine learning people, this should uh, really uh, be interpreted uh, in, in the light of uh, the difference between Bayesian decision-making where we aggregate the uh, points of view coming from different models of the world versus maximum likelihood or like standard model-free reinforcement learning where you essentially have a single view of how the world works behind the decision. And the chances are it's not going to be the right one. And so you're going to be taking risky actions, typically. So that's not safe. It could you know, make it that uh, we lose control of an AI system. And then it's not just the, the, the dictator. The, you know, it's not just the, everyone else that is losing, but also the dictator is losing because we all lose humans lose lose if uh, we end up with a rogue autonomous AI. So what can you do about power concentration? Well, this is not a new problem. I mean, the whole point of having a democracy, you know, the revolutions, like the, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, they were all about toppling down excessive power concentration in the hands of a king and their family. Um, so... Market democracies have built all sorts of institutional uh, methods to try to uh, reduce power concentration. And by the way, even the theory of markets tell us that concentration of wealth uh, is not good because uh, uh, you know it, it leads to, say, the domination of one corporation or very few. Uh, in, in a market. And, and that is bad in terms of market efficiency. Market efficiency requires that all the players in the market are very small. And in fact, in the limit, they should be like infinitesimal. Um, 
but the 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 way that our markets work and uh, uh, incentiv uh, incentivize corporations to maximize their economic domination because that's the objective of of those companies by you know, otherwise they lose that they don't have a choice and that may be at odds with um the general well-being and especially of those that are worse off in in a market economy um so what what market democracies have done in in many countries is try to uh, avoid that extreme power concentration in the hands of a few companies for example or a few people by uh, having taxation laws to redistribute wealth and breaking monopolies unfortunately i think in the last few decades they haven't done enough uh, on those fronts but that's that's what they should be doing and because ai is going to bring about uh, a lot of power in the hands of a few people and companies i think uh democratic governments it, it should be concerned about that okay um so what can they do well you want to avoid a situation where a single individual or corporation controls dangerously powerful ai systems which which is where we are going now so it's it's really urgent that governments um start um uh, thinking about how to avoid that situation. And the, the natural kind of answer to this, um, in, in addition to the traditional tools uh, that, that governments have, is um, governance, right? So make sure that we set the rules of how these companies or any kind of organization um, operate these AI systems, such that the way that these systems are used is aligned with um, the objectives of the government, or even better, the objectives of, you know, the international community. So we want to take the very powerful AI systems out of the hands of the, you know, a few people, maybe even eventually out of the hands of for-profit corporations altogether, because they see economic dominance, which seeks, you know, which means extreme wealth and then extreme power. And maybe a good analogy here is nuclear bombs. So, uh, it's it's illegal in in most countries, I guess every country, for any company to start building their own nuclear bomb, unless the the, the government asks us to you know to help with that. And if you think eventually AI systems will be as powerful as nuclear bombs or more, in fact, I think we'll eventually converge to a scenario where the governments understand that they have to be in control of of that power, uh, not not. Uh, for-profit corporations. There's um, there's a concept that I really think is important here, uh, especially in the context of avoiding the worst possible uh, risk, which is the you know existential risk, loss of control to a uh, rogue autonomous AI. It's the idea that we should avoid having a single point of failure, like a place where you know there could be a mistake. That could be, uh, uh, you know, actions that that lead, uh, very few actions that lead to uh, the, the the existential risk scenario. Um, and I think this is related to the question of how can a democratic humanity be sustainable in the long term uh, in a world where we know how to build superhuman AI systems. This I don't have the answer to this, but but I think. The aspect of single point of failure is important because if there is a single point of failure, then the chances that this will not be sustainable, that somebody will make the mistake, and then we end up with superhuman AI that are dangerous for humanity, they're rogue. Um, so this this is all like very hard questions. Um, but so how do we avoid single points of failure? Well, you don't want to have a single individual, a single corporation, or even a single government with too much power, with too much control over a powerful AI system. Uh, because if um, they accrue too much power, then others cannot stop them. And as I said earlier, um, they could lose that power to the AI itself. Okay, so uh, we don't want that. Um, and and as you know, I there's, there's probably a lot more that needs to be discussed about uh, how, how we could deal with that. But but I think it's important to keep this issue in mind. 
there is a um, there's a related issue which uh, uh, comes up very often in discussions between AI researchers and also uh, the legislators who are starting to worry about AI risks. It's the question of open source. Should we allow open source of AI systems or not? And actually, I'm going to try to convince you that the answer should be yes in some cases and probably for now, and no at some point in the future or for particular kinds of AI systems. So the answer doesn't need to be black and white. I've been a huge proponent of open source and open science for many decades for all my, my research life. But, but you know, being open is not the ultimate goal. It's it's a means to an end. The the end being you know the the global uh, well being of humanity, at least in my case. So so let's see what could happen when we share um, the code and the trained weights, for example, of um, AI systems. So let's consider uh, four categories of effects. The first one is that sharing will give rise to faster development. In fact, it will increase the speed at which we make progress, both scientifically and technically, uh, engineering-wise. And this is a good thing if the AI we build are not dangerous. However, if society is not ready you know, in a sustainable way to handle the existence of very powerful AI systems, in the hands of anyone, because the thing with open source is that essentially anyone can download these things and they could use it for good applications or they could have malicious goals. And because these technologies are essentially dual use, which is the main theme of my presentation, uh, making it available to everyone means you make it available to bad actors, which means we will have serious problems. And that's entering into the effect of the, you know, the second category of effect, like the harm from misuse. So what kind of um, harm may happen? Well, if if we have what I wrote, like low power AI, so it, you know, it's not, it's far from human level AI and it, maybe it's very specialized. So it can't really be become uh, rogue and, and you know, um, talk people into things that could be dangerous for humanity. So the risk exists with low power AI, but it's probably manageable. With high power AI, so approaching AGI, well, well, th th this could be terrible, both from the point of view of power concentration and loss of control to rogue AIs. Um, third category to look at is of course, the possible uh, loss of control to autonomous rogue AI. With with low power AI, well, the risk is is low. I mean, it's it's essentially zero. Um, but of course, with high power AI, it would be very high. So if why would it be very high? Because somebody could make a mistake. Somebody could uh, just uh, type a new goal for the AI systems to preserve itself, and, and we're all done. And if if you know, it's it's enough that one person out of eight billion decides to do it. Um, so this is going to happen if if we don't put the right access barriers, which means we we don't allow open source for everything, but only for um, uh, codes and, and and models that are not dangerous from that point of view. Now the last category is important though, um, and I think that's the reason why so many people cling to the idea that we should continue full pin open source. And it's because open source um, helps to decentralize power. And remember, I you know I talked about concentration of power as as one of the big risks. Um, and it's true for low power AI. You know, it enables more people to compete. Um, and it's true for high power AI, which uh, means you don't have concentration of power in the hands of just one organization. Um, but but of course, uh, if the cost of training is huge, then you still get some sort of, I mean, it's not a perfect solution. Um, and of course you have the other risks. So we have to balance all those risks. And my conclusion, you know, thinking about all this is there's a threshold somewhere in, you know, how strong the AI is below which, or how specialized, which is related, 
below which um, open source is great. So I actually think that Llama 2 being shared is, is not a bad thing. It's helping uh, many people do things. Uh, it, it is actually helping the research in AI safety. More people can play with these models and see, uh, you know, better understand what can go wrong. But th there's a point, and I don't know where that threshold is, where it's going to become dangerous. So, yeah, that's for open source. Um, uh, a few more little things. Um, so I've talked about the the dangers. Let me go a little bit more uh, detail. In what can go wrong with powerful AI systems? Well, one of the maybe shorter term dangers is that they could be used to influence political opinion. Um, and especially through, so what is new here with things like uh, uh, chatbots is that they could do this through dialogue. If you are in a dialogue uh, in a social media, um, you, and, 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 and you, know, you, you have the impression you're talking to a real human. Um, you might try to convince them to change their mind, but they're also trying to convince you to change their mind. And of course, you will not be really able to change their mind because it's an AI. But it, but you know you might change your opinion, and if it's just one AI, that's not a big deal. But of course, once you have an AI, you can easily you know create an army of AI trolls. And in fact, uh, if such an army gets deployed, the first thing that's probably going to happen is that the AI is going to be collecting data about what works and what doesn't work, so that they can learn to be stronger, you know, in their ability to influence us and make us change our minds. And eventually, potentially, we don't know, develop ways of pressing on our buttons that are even stronger than uh, how, you know, currently humans are already trying to influence each other, but but we have developed defenses against this, uh, you know, individual defenses and collective defenses. But, but, you know, what if AI systems emerge in the coming years that are much better than humans at influencing us? Then, of course, uh, there's the danger of AIs being used to uh, design powerful weapons. Uh, so I talked about disinformation, but also think about cyber attacks, chemical weapons. There was a recent paper showing how you can just change one line of code in a, a machine learning system that designs uh, new uh, useful and not toxic drugs. And you just you know remove the not there and, and you make it toxic. So now you can, you, you know, this thing proposed uh, hundreds of new compounds that could be uh, uh, chemical weapons. It could be very toxic. In fact, it rediscovered existing uh, chemical weapons, the VX uh, nerve agent. Um, maybe even worse than chemical weapons are uh, biological weapons, because the difference between chemical weapons and biological weapons is that if you create a new pathogen, like a new virus or a new bacteria that kills people, um, these pathogens can reproduce themselves. Like, you know, a compound, and, you know, it goes into one place, it kills the people in that place, but it doesn't kill the whole planet. Whereas a new virus could kill everyone. And of course, why would a person do that? Well, maybe they don't realize that it could go out of control. There are already, you know, military efforts that have, have happened to try to design these things. And we have international treaties to prevent them. And then, of course, that there is the use of AI as a tool to control the populations with drones, with face tracking, internet monitoring, and so on. And this is already happening in China. Okay, uh, I'm running out of time, but um, I I wrote um, a like 14 page document for the U.S. Senate uh, that was uh, presented on July 25th. Um, where I talk about how governments could intervene uh, with regulation in order to reduce those risks. And I talked about different regulation levers having to do with controlling access, like who can tinker with misuse technology, so like things like licensing and registration and, and so on. Um, doing research, in, you know, investing in research to improve our ability to uh, deal with alignment problems. Um, uh, making sure that the ability to build very powerful systems is controlled, like uh, you know, controlling who has access to uh, large quantities of uh, GPUs, for example, and so on. 
um, and making sure that we set the regulations so that the AI systems have limited uh, abilities to act in the world, so they can't do too much damage. Um, a few little points. Uh, right now, we don't know, as I said, to how to build systems that are uh, safe and, and, and fair. Um, so I think in terms of regulation, we should be a, you know, going for prudence and ban the most powerful AI systems that could have catastrophic effect until we figure out how to do this properly. Um, also, as I mentioned, specialized AI. So think about medical diagnostic or helping with agriculture, but, but you know, AI systems that haven't been reading all of the internet uh, are probably safe uh, or their harm they could do is very limited. So we should not think about AI globally being regulated in you know strong ways, but it depends on the risks. Um, last thing I want to mention is that there uh, one thing I'm working on, following up on the work of Stuart Russell in 2019 in his book Human Compatible, is um, I believe that it is possible to build safe AI systems in the sense that that we eliminate or reduce considerably the risks of misalignment um, using some of the ideas that he put forward and using some of the recent work in uh, probabilistic machine learning and, you know, and GFLNS that I've been working on. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. And please take the time to think about all this. Uh, it took me months and months to digest some of these uh, thoughts. Uh, take the time. Thank you very much, Prof. Yashar for this truly inspiring.